God in the Old and the New Testament is described as our shepherd, right? Think of that Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. In the epistles, we get descriptions of the great shepherd of the sheep. It's this picture that comes up many times in scripture. It's a beloved picture. You may have it stitched on a throw pillow somewhere in your house about God being your shepherd. What does it mean though? What does it mean that God is our shepherd? I think one thing, one obvious thing is that we are being led by God. That when the Bible tells us that God is our shepherd, the Lord is our shepherd, we should be thinking about, we should be rethinking our lives as lives that are being led, led by someone specifically by the almighty God, right? It's not aimless lives that are just kind of proceeding forward one rotation of the earth at a time, one trip around the sun at a time without any meaning or distinction between what came before and what after. No, we are being led by a shepherd. We are being led by an almighty God who has a purpose and a power and a plan and a wisdom and love in the way he leads us. Jesus has this in mind when he's teaching us to pray. Here as we come to essentially the end of the Lord's Prayer as it's presented in Matthew chapter 6. Right, we already started. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then finally verse 13. And lead us. Lead us. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or maybe you have a footnote, or if you have the NIV, some translations point out the evil one, specifically thinking about our adversary, the devil, Satan there. Not just evil as some weird force that kind of radiates through the air, but a specific, I want to use a fancy word, personified evil. It always comes in something concrete in a person. So we're praying, the one who leads us, Heavenly Father, as you lead us as our shepherd, lead us not into temptation or the time of trial or into testing or into these hardships, but deliver us, deliver us from evil and the evil one. Probably important to clarify here that when we say, Lord, lead us not into temptation, doesn't mean we should say, every time I'm tempted, that's God. God, why'd you do that? Why'd you put that... uh, frustration with my coworker there? Why did you put that desire to speak without kind of guarding my lips at all out there? Why did you put that opportunity to lust out there? God, why did you do that? No, James very clearly teaches us in the scripture, like, no, we, when, when we're being tempted, we shouldn't blame God. God doesn't tempt anyone in that way. When we're asking him to lead us. We are asking to lead us not to temptation, We are asking for him to protect us from sin. That sin that just in the verse before and that we talked about yesterday, uh, that we need forgiveness from, we need forgiveness for. Yes, do, Lord, protect us. Keep us away from it. Keep us safe from harm physically and spiritually. But it's got God who ultimately tempts us. He brings us to the front door of sin and causes us to walk through that, that doorway of sin. That is our own sinful hearts that deserve the blame for that. But again, when you pray, protect us from the sin, deliver us from evil and the evil one. We feel our vulnerability in life in so many different ways. I bet you feel that maybe even right now, there's just vulnerability that's felt. And so we pray, Lord, you're the one who's leading us. Heavenly Father, our good shepherd, lead us not into temptation, not into a time of trial, and deliver us from the evil one, keep us safe here. So what does our good shepherd do? How does he lead us? Well, he himself is struck. In Matthew 26, quoting an Old Testament passage from Zechariah, Jesus warns his disciples, he said, you'll all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. They're all going to run off. They're going to be scared to stand with Jesus during his trial and during his arrest. But he himself will be struck. Why? Why is Jesus struck? Why does he enter the time of trial? That's what he says happens here. If you looked down in verse 41, you'd see that 
uh, that temptation word come back up in Matthew 26, verse 41. And I pray that you do not enter into temptation. Same thing as Matthew 6, 13, same word. Why is he entering into this? Why is he struck? Why is he entering the time of trial and temptation? Well, it's to lead us away from the evil one. It's to lead us away from a life of temptation. He is struck. He is pierced, as we will see on Good Friday, as we read about in the prophet Isaiah, quoted many times over in the New Testament. He's pierced for our transgressions. He's stricken, smitten by God. It's by his wounds that we are healed. It's by his crucifixion, by his willingness to suffer and die in our place that we have any victory over the evil one, right? First John puts that very bluntly. It says the reason that Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil. And you see that over and over again in the New Testament. Jesus came to conquer, to have victory over the evil one, over all these powers and principalities that seem to rule right now. Jesus has come to lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from the evil one. That's how God, first and foremost, answers his prayer. And as he continues to lead us in our lives right now, as our good shepherd, we see that often he actually does bring us into trials, right? James brings that up, makes it very clear. He's like, Count it all joy when you encounter trials, times of temptation, testing times, of all sorts of kinds, physical, spiritual, whatever. Count it all joy. Why? Because God's doing something. It's, it's, the, the, the testing of your faith produces all these sorts of things that will deliver you from the evil one, right? Uh, again, Paul talks over and over again that we follow Jesus. We were made like Jesus. We die like Jesus. We were put to death certain earthly things in us like Jesus. We suffer like Jesus because that's the way of victory. That's the way of life. To be uh, led into a sort of death like his is to be led into life. The way of deliverance from the evil one is the way of following Jesus, of being made like him in his death and then also in his resurrection. That's in many ways what we celebrate here on Good Friday and Easter is not just that this death and resurrection happens to Jesus, but by the Spirit it's a gift that happens to us that we die and rise again. Not just at the end, but even here now we have this new birth that comes when we repent of our sins. So my application isn't even really an application right now. Certainly continue to pray this. Pray the Lord's Prayer. Use it as like a starting point for many of your prayers, of dedicated prayer time. But we should be doing here right now this week, especially this Thursday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Saturday, Easter Sunday, is to consider Jesus. Meditate on what he's done. Meditate how he entered into the time of trial. Meditate on He how he uh, was seemingly afflicted by the evil one, but was actually defeating the evil one, disarming him by being crucified on the cross. Just meditate, consider Jesus. Think about it. Let what he's done sink in deep. Do it through reading Matthew 26, 27, 28. Do it through song and prayer and time together. Find ways to just consider Jesus who makes it so that we're led not into temptation and we're delivered from evil. Again, I look forward to being together again sometime soon. I long for that. I pray for that. I don't know when it will be. Um, I don't have reason to think it'll be any time terribly soon, but we will see what the Lord will do and what he is doing right now. So God bless. Um, have a great Maundy Thursday.